Hello, everybody. Welcome to our event this evening. Sorry, there was a little bit of background noise then. Um, I am sorry for the delay. We've had a few technical issues, as we're all still experiencing two years into lots of technology. Um, but thank you for bearing with us and apologies for that. We have got Simpson with us, so I'm going to bring him in in just a second. But to start with, a few little things. So first of all, my name is Emma. I am Communications Manager at Save the Rhino International and I'm so, so happy to be here with you all this evening. Or this morning or this afternoon, it really depends where you are in the world because we have lots of people internationally based. So whatever part of your day it is, I hope you're having a good day. And we are going to be spending the next 45 minutes or so chatting away to an absolute rhino legend. Just before I introduce you to him, two little things. So first of all, you may have seen a graphic or a small short video just now sharing our appeal, which at the moment is focusing on Namibia, which is very exciting and obviously matches this evening's event. Um, and I would just want to say, I just want to say, sorry, that it is Giving Tuesday today, which means that it's an international day of giving and generosity. And if you can donate, we would be very, very grateful. And we have matched funding this year, which we're very lucky to have. So every single pound or dollar or euro that you donate will be doubled for that appeal today. So if you are able to donate, there should be a link somewhere on the page near you in the chat box, um, or you can just head to saverino.org forward slash keep rhinos connected and you'll find a donation box just there. Obviously, do stay for this chat and then go and do that afterwards if you wish. And then secondly, we have some amazing questions that you submitted in advance. But if you do have any questions that you would like to ask Simpson while we are live, then please do comment those in the chat box. You may need to log in to do that. So just be aware that you might have a little login issue before you go ahead and add a comment in. But we'd love to see where you are, where you are from, where you are today. So please do add a little comment try and interact with other people that are watching and yeah let's enjoy a lovely conversation so without further ado i'll bring simpson on simpson is the ceo of saint rhino trust namibia and he has been there for more than 30 years which is just extraordinary and last week he received the the incredible prince william award for conservation in africa so welcome simpson hello oh uh, thank you uh, <laughs> how are you doing simpson I'm fine. How are you doing, Emma? I am very good, thank you. Unfortunately, we were hoping to be in the same room or at least the same building today, um, and the travel changes meant that Simpson went back to Namibia instead. So we have actually, we, we're doing this internationally. We're not doing it from the UK. We're both meant to be in London. So we're still here. We've got this, but it's a shame not to see you in person, of course. I do hear though that you're a bit of a celebrity because you came back with your incredible trophy and then you had a long drive from Windhoek to your home and now you've just, you know, you've got this big trophy. I think it's nearby. Do you want to hold it up and let everyone see? Okay, let me hold it up. <laughs> and um, here is the certificate. <laughs> how, was, how was receiving the trophies? And did you enjoy it? I enjoyed it. I was very excited receiving them. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was looking forward because I I know about it uh, like three yeah. months ago. So I was really happy to um, go and receive them. It's amazing. And it is a Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, and as I just said, you've been at the Rhino Trust for 30 years. So a true lifetime of Rhino conservation. Um, and you got to meet Prince William. But I don't think that was your first time meeting him. Is that right? Have you met him before? No, I met him twice already. I met him once at the task 25th anniversary in um, uh, in, in London. And then the second time uh, he came out here and we were on a, a rhino trekking for, I think, three plus hours. And um, yeah, we found the rhino actually at the end of the day, but I only uh, watched it for 30 minutes and there it's gone. So, yeah. but it was worth doing it. He, he could see how hard it is to find the rhino in the desert. It's like looking for a needle in a desert. So yeah, it's, it, it's very special, I should say, because you sweat before you see it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't speak to that experience because it's one I'm still yet to have, and I would love to have, but, um, but it's incredible to know that, you know, people are out looking for rhinos that whole time and then, it's that glimpse, isn't it? That moment when there's sort of a few minutes with one animal and then 
it's gone for another another however long. So um, yeah. yeah. Awesome. And, and the problem also was he was only here in Namibia for twenty four hours, so we didn't really ah. have enough time to follow it again and and spot it again. So that was it. But he was very happy. Uh, he has seen a rhino, and they are there. Yeah. I mean, how special to see 24 hours, quick in and out, and you get to see a rhino. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, <laughs> and walk like 13, 14 kilometers in the desert. Wow. It was, it was really uh, an experience. And I, I think he, he, he still um, appreciate it, you know. So it, it was a real experience for him. Amazing. And... Of course, we're in a very different environment now. So I was chatting to Simpson a bit earlier about how it's been very cold here. We're in London and, and he's obviously in the Kunedi region of Namibia. So it's quite a different temperature right now. And in fact, he's still got some daylight outside and we haven't. Um, but I did want to just ask how, what did you think? What was your favourite part of the last, the most recent trip to London? Have you got any special moments? I know you came over with your wife as well, Shalini. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that was very special. That was really special because I've been for so many times to um, London and I have even studying for a year in London and I was alone all the time. And this time I could go with my wife and I mean, show her all the wonders. I will say the wonders that's out there because we don't see those things there. We, were been, we have been on the London Eye. We have been on the boat with, on the Thames River. We have been to the Tower Bridge. I mean, it was really good and she really, really enjoyed it. So for me, it was real excitement and also going her meeting Prince William again uh, for the first time, being for the first time in London. I mean, I was really very excited. It's so amazing. I, I love it because every time that, you know, someone, someone in our team or someone that we know comes out to see you, they say the same thing. <laughs> They're like, I got to meet yeah. Simpson and had this incredible time tracking these rhinos. And yeah, it's just, it's just incredible. Um, yeah. But I will, I'll get into a few of the questions. So to start with, I just wanted to, I wanted to share with the audience, I wanted you to share with the audience how you got into your work now. So you've been at SRT for, say, the Rhino Trust, sorry, if I say SRT, that's where I'm going, um, <laughs> for 30 years. So I know you didn't start as CEO, so you, you've sort of done numerous roles over that time. How has that been? What what happened those thirty years ago? Okay, thirty years ago, I was I was uh, working at my house, um, just doing some maintenance work on uh, vehicles. I was I'm, I can weld. I'm a welder. I'm an electrician. I'm man of all trades actually. So um, one day, uh, Blair Lutid, who is the founder director of uh, Save the Rhino Trust, had a breakdown on a Sunday, and nobody could help her. So somebody uh, referred her to me. And she came um, and she asked me whether I can repair a land rover for her that was broken. The chassis was actually broken. So it was hard work and I had to weld it. So I had to tow it in, I weld it and give it back to her. She paid me and she said, thank you. I will maybe come back again. So like a week ago, she came back again and she said, um, I, I think I've got something that I want you to do on my, on my car on her vehicle now that she was driving, which was also a Land Rover. She wanted rails to put, be put up and some reinforcement on the on the body itself. So I did this for her and I mean, she was very happy and she walked off. Um, but then she came back again, like after two two weeks and she said, man, I think um, I want to get you into SRT. But by then SRT was only she and I think four trackers and a few game rats and one vehicle, two vehicles, actually the one that she was driving and the other one that the trackers were driving. So I said, um, no, fine. She said, I mean, we don't have really a lot of money. I can pay you a 500 Namibian dollars, which I think was something around 20 pounds at that time. I said, no, that's fine. I mean, I will keep myself busy with, with different things and learn more. So, so I start. But I started as a supervisor, so I was now supervising those guys that was building um, the elephant protection dams around the, the world. But that was a WWF project, but was seconded to SRT, so Save the Rhino Trust was responsible for it. So I was actually monitoring those guys that were doing this. Um, one day she called me and she said, um, this, the only vehicle that we had that's on patrol out in the field is broken down. So 
Um, can I take you there so that we can, you can have a look at what the problem was? Okay, I went there, um, I fixed the car, and then I said, I want to stay with the guys for maybe another four or five days just to check what they're doing. So every morning we would go out and we would find rhinos here and rhinos. I mean, at that time, rhinos were really distributed nicely in the area. And, and, and it, I mean, it was so nice. It was raining. There was lots of food for the rhinos. And so I, I, I did start uh, 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 loving this, this whole thing of, of going out with the guys and seeing rhinos every day. So after five days, I went back and then, um, um, I, I carry on with my work, but I, then I told her, I, I think I want to go out maybe once a month for maybe four days or five days with the trekking team so that I can learn how to track rhinos and things like that. So she said, okay, that's fine. And then you can teach them how to repair the cars and stuff like that. I said, that's fine. So I start going out, going out. And then one donor came in and he bought us a vehicle. So I had my own vehicle now that I could drive around with so and then um as we were carrying on working i got more into the rhino stuff i my love and patient goes to to the rhinos and i start swinging to the rhinos but at the, at the same time i was also doing elephant monitoring i was i was like um working on the elephants in the wild but monitoring them but but just do it and then um while i was busy with this and the elephants uh the film uh, maker actually Martin Kohlbeck came in. He used to work in Kenya, but he's from London. Um, he came in, or yeah, he came in, and uh, I spent some time with him filming the elephants. I was guiding him actually, and he was doing the filming. And at the sort of at the end of the film, uh, a month or two later, Cynthia Moth, which is they call her the elephant lady, she's also in Kenya, but she's from the US, um, she came and and join us in the field and we were like working working and one day towards the end of the program he asked me um i think i can see you are really interested in elephants um don't you think i can take you to kenya and and, and really teach you all the things around the elephants how to sex them how to age them their behavior and all those kind of things the whole theory so i said um yeah she said we will pay for everything. AWF, African Wildlife Foundation, will pay for everything. We will pay for your ticket, your stay there, and everything, and equipment. So I said, no, it's good. Thanks. That was 1997. So I went for a week. No, not for a week. I went for a month and a half, actually. And I did my my, my sort of training there. And, um, and then at the end of the day, she said, okay, now you are a credit trainer. You can go back to Namibia and train the others also what you have been taught here. So I said, thanks. And um, I came back and I start training people in elephant behavior, all the community game guards, some ministry people and all those guys. So I was training those guys. But I still had my work with the rhinos now very hard. So I worked my way up and um, I become later um, the director of field operations. And I was doing now all the work in the field deployment of guys and data collection and i mean bringing data to one place and my science advisor will help to analyze the data and all those kind of things and 2002 2001 actually uh, late mike hearn who used to be a volunteer who was sent up by save the rhino international um actually uh, went back to the he came as a volunteer and he was working and he went back to the UA to, to complete his master's degree after he had all this experience and the field experience and collect all the data. And so so he did his master's degree so well that he actually received an award for two Namibians to go back to the same university to DICE, to University of Kent, uh, DICE, to do uh, their master's degrees in conservation biology and conservation and tourism. So I mm -hmm. select, he select me. And I was like, but I, I didn't even have an under degree. How can I go and just do a master's degree? And they mm -hmm. said, no, but you've got 13 years of experience, which allow yeah. you to do that. I mean, there's nothing about it. You just go and study. And, and so I said, oh, not really well prepared, but I will, I will, I will go. So um, the other guy was having an under degree. And I mean, he was good. And, but we, we went together and I mean, came there. 
Um, the other guys, all of them were having, some of them already had master's degrees, but they did some other master's degrees again. Others were having other degrees and diplomas and stuff. But I said, okay, I will start. The first time I was a bit confused, but like, like writing the first assignment and then going into the second one, I was switched on and then I focused on my work. Um, I finished my, my, my degree. Um, I did it with merit and I came back to Namibia. And as I came back, um, actually, uh, some guys in the ministry actually wanted me to join the ministry. And I said, I don't think I want to go anywhere from here. I'm, I'm keeping you safe that I'm until the last day, which was a very good decision that I actually made because um, by now, I think there should have been no SRT or Save the Rhino Trust Namibia if I was gone. So, wow. um, yeah, and then I worked my way up. Coming back there, I was the, and as I was coming back in 2004, September 2005, um, January actually, Mike drawn in the sea and he was no more there. So I had to take over immediately from him. And that was actually the whole reason why he was taught uh, he was given this degree to train two Namibians to the same level. One day, if he's not there, then they can take over and carry on with what they were doing. So, and 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 that that actually makes me very happy. And I mean, it's a big honor to him. Um, we still remember him. And um, yeah, we, we we buried him here in Namibia at Palambach in our Rhino region in the area. And and thanks to and, and late Tom and Nick and Nicholas and Jim, his brothers and mother and father that actually uh, give us that privilege to bury him here with us. Um, we are very proud having him still here, his grave and we looking after it. So, and then um, I still worked my way up uh, becoming the deputy director. And then um, five years ago, I was actually um, appointed as the first uh, black CEO of the Save the Rhino Trust um, Namibia. So, and I'm very proud to be um, the CEO of the Trust. And I'm very proud of all my staff because I had the support I needed at all times from my staff. And, and that's why I, am, I, I actually won this award today. It's because of my staff and my communities, my traditional leaders, all the respect they had my board of trustees, that's it. That's amazing. What an inspiring story. And I think we had quite a few questions in before, and I know a lot of people watching today are people that are really passionate about conservation. They really want to, you know, start their careers. And so many of them were saying, you know, how did you get into this? And how did, what's your role been like at Save the Rhino Trust? And what have you been doing? So that was just a brilliant answer. Thank you. <laughs> Um, but as you as you have you know been at Safe Valley Trust for so long, one thing that I did want to ask is, you know, in that thirty year time, there's been so much change in rhino conservation globally, but of course in Namibia nationally as well. What what have you seen that's really changed in that time, and what do you think SR, how has SRT changed? Sorry, in that time. Thank you very much. It's an important question. Um, first of all, all the rhinos belongs to the government. Secondly, Save the Rhino Trust do have an agreement with the government or a memorandum of understanding to look after all the rhinos in the Kunene region, Northwest region, um, which is the only place in the whole world where you get free roaming black rhinos between communities. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what have changed is actually the Namibian government have been so good that they have actually uh, start working on this conservancy program. I mean, we start negotiating with the communities from the first day that I start, the 2nd of July, which was my birthday, 1991. My first task was to go out with the ministry people and translate for the communities what the ministry wanted from them. And that was actually how the conservancy program start. So we will go, me and maybe a director from the Ministry of Environment and Tourism, and um, maybe so two people, we will go out and then um, we will go to a community. We will call the people together, we'll sit under a tree and we will start explaining what the, I mean, the government wants you to take the ownership of this wildlife. And you have to stay with the wildlife. It wasn't really an easy task. At some communities, 
I mean, we will talk to this community and they will already tell the others in, on the way. Be careful. They want us to stay with the lions in our houses. <laughs> you know, they want us to stay with the elephants in our houses. It's our Namibian government. So we will explain to them actually what, what, what the whole thing was. It was difficult in the, in the beginning, but people start to understand. Say, oh, okay. I can have elephants. I can bring tourists in. I can get benefits from there. I can sell a kudu. I can sell a springbok. I can, mm -hmm. you know, so everything becomes mine. So I can make decisions on how I want to use them. Because now, right now, they are just there, coming and breaking my pipes and wasting my water and go away and I have to fix. Mm -hmm. But now with this idea, everything becomes yours. And then you get the benefits from there. And then you can sort of solve your problem. So after a, a year or two years, this thing has actually become a reality. Some conservancies, like in five, six years, some conservancies have already started um, 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 registering their conservancies. They have been um, documented and, and cassetted in the Namibian uh, law. They have worked out their um, management plans and they were up and going. They could do joint ventures with lodges that in the area and which they didn't, couldn't do. I mean, in the past, they just saw there is a lot. There is tourists coming there. There they're going. Here they come, driving behind our house, not even saying good morning, and they go. But all these things have changed. And now that people have got this whole thing of the wildlife as ours, the, the, the one question was, what about the rhinos? Why are they here? What are we getting from them? You know, do we really have to care about them? So that was now my chance to go in and start talking to the people. You know, guys, we are looking after this rhino. This rhino belongs to the government. But we want you to benefit from this rhino because they are with you. They don't really, the rhinos don't cause any competition or problems to people. They avoid coming closer to people. That's what mm -hmm. I know from them. And, but still, we explain to them, you can take tourists out Tourists can pay you directly, or the conservancy. You share that money. So slowly, we started with this program and teach people and 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 make them to understand how things were working. Um, now, when I was doing my master's degree, uh, I was actually my thesis was on people's attitude towards the reintroduction of rhino in the historical ranch. So I had to go out uh, to the community. I actually select three conservancies, which I went to. And I interviewed like 300 people, 300 households in the conservancies. Only, I, I, had, I think I had 100 or something like questions of 30 or 60. So I had questions there that I asked people, have you ever seen rhino? What do you think about rhino? Are there competition with people? You know, all those kind of things. What do you think can you benefit from rhino, having rhinos in your area? So I was just writing up, writing up, writing up, pile up all the papers, put them in a bag, over to UK again, put them aside in my room, checking them out and analyzing them and write up a paper. <laughs> and I came out with um, the answer that the one conservancy, 78 people of 78 respondents wants rhino in their conservancy. The other one was 98, and the other one, I think, was 88. Okay, well, yeah, three conservancies. So I came back, and I put my proposal. I, I, I give my thesis to the government also, and then we start negotiating. And then we said, OK, uh, we will look for funding, and we will reintroduce rhinos into these three conservancies. So. The one conservancy was very lucky, which is called Twading Huas, Elephant's Corner, because there are so many elephants in that conservancy. It was kind of a problem area that becomes a, a success story, you see. So there were so many elephants causing problems, and people were against it. I mean, that's actually where we start with the whole survey, mm -hmm. and that pe why people were so against it, because, I mean, they had so many years of problems with elephants and they didn't really get anything back that they could see it's a benefit for them having their elephants here there so uh, we start with the rhinos and then um, we said okay first we will reintroduce rhinos into 
Squadding, squadding was, as I say. Um, there we put on, put in two bulls, but there was an, another conservancy next to it where there were, uh, that's actually the stronghold of the, the, the population in our region, that conservancy. So uh, we just put two bulls in to see how it will go because bulls are normally cheap and, and, and just to settle down and see what they will do. We put them in for like a test. Um, they actually settled down and um, we had, I think, two cows moving over from the other conservancy in there. We had another cow that we brought in. The one bull actually moved out from the conservancy, went into another conservancy, and it was fine. And um, suddenly there was this breeding going on. And within, I think, 10 or 12 years, we had 10 plus animals in that conservancy. But it's not. Yeah, and it's it, it's not open uh, open land where you can see rhinos everywhere. It's mountains, it's rivers. It, it's so difficult, but we know how to do it. <laughs> okay, so that was the first conservancy, and luckily at that time the European Union actually built for the community a lodge. So uh, with co-management from a private uh, partner, um, they started the lodge. And they had rhino trekking tourism as uh, one of their activities. Mm -hmm. It went so well. I mean, in the first year, I think they had something like between a hundred thousand and a million Namibian dollars just from oh. rhino trekking tourism. That went straight to the communities. And the communities opened their eyes and said, Whoa, this is how things work. Just bringing in tourism, so the tourists, the, the, the rhinos, and we have some money. So, we also put rhinos into other conservancies and talk to the communities and um, sign agreements with the communities that say they will take the responsibility of rhinos and we will be there to assess them and train them and, and train them how to do the monitoring and everything. And then in 2011, actually, we, you know, yeah, we started a, a smaller program that we said we called the Rhino Ranger program. So we asked each on seven C actually now to employ two people that we will sort of take over and look after. They will pay them, but we will get them all the benefits. So mm -hmm. they will be going out to the field. They will get a field day bonus. If they see a rhino, they will get a rhino siding bonus. We will buy them guinea forms, food, transport them to the field to do the work. So that actually also started well. We had at the one state, we had maybe um, six rhino rangers. And two, three years later, I think we had 40 some odd. And now, the other day when I was doing this um, rhino ranger award ceremony, giving them prizes for their good job that they have done throughout the year, um, we had 60 plus. So from Save the Rhino Trust only having um, 30 plus people as, as, as trekkers, we had that 60 people extra. So now we're now talking about 100 people. And I know and that that's the, that, that Ranger program is the same program that you're working with the government on to expand into other areas. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah it's, it's, so it's, that's the one that our appeal for Nai Nai Conservancy in Northeastern Namibia is. Now, right now, right now uh, four of my senior staff are at Nai Nai uh, training the people. I have been there. To set up the program, talk to the headman and everybody, and um, I win the support of everybody there. So I came back, and as I went to the UK, uh, four of my most senior people, like the science advisor, the COO, chief uh, operations officer, the director of operations, and the principal field officer are now there training the people. And I talked to them yesterday. They said everything is going so smooth and well. Brilliant. So that's another area that we have actually now included into our program which yeah. is um, about um, maybe 700 to 800 kilometers away from where we are. Yeah. But that's also a community, a communal yeah. area. And I mean, we have taken the responsibility of working with rhinos on communal land. So yeah. that's why we're doing this now. And I think yeah. that's, so you're, you're so passionate about community citizen and it comes across every time you speak. But I think that's what's incredible about the program is because it really is, it's not, you know, as you said, it's people that live 
hundreds of kilometers away from where you are now, but you're working alongside everyone there to create this passionate community about rhinos and help help people to save rhinos and other wildlife around. And actually on that question, on that point, sorry, I have a question from Naisha from Singapore saying, what's the best part about your job? And I do wonder if that's about communities and people or if it's about it's, rhinos or maybe both. It's meeting people, working with people and teaching people how to work with rhinos. Yeah. And be part of the whole family. So <laughs> I love working with people with the traditional authority, monastery people, um, the police officers that we've asked, I, I, I want always that smile on people's faces when we talk about rhinos. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's my part. I, I want Best to get involved into rhino conservation, rhino protection, and on the end of the day, still have a smile on his face for what a good job he has done. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, Okay, so so with someone on a smile on their face for thirty years, what and um, what do you think has kept your passion for rhino conservation alive? And that is from James from Uganda. James, a uh, good question. James, the support I am getting from my people, the trust I had on the ground from my community, my traditional authorities, my government, uh, my ministry line ministries, all the support that I had. With, with them, from them actually, um, yeah. give me the courage to do more and more good works and save our rhino on, in Namibia. And not only in Namibia, but also in other places by sharing my experience with other people in other countries that has got rhinos. Because um, if we don't do it the right way, one day we will sit without rhinos in Africa. Mm -hmm. And it's for sure. And then we will only have rhinos in the zoos in the stage in uk in australia and so on and that's what we don't want for the future generation we want them always to be able to see a four-legged horny rhino walking on the planet <laughs> true and that's why events like this are so important so we can share it um so we have another one from allison in the uk who says what would be the one thing that is a top priority that you do with your work. So what's your one thing maybe each day when you think that is the, that's the priority today? Um, the one thing is, first of all, I have to listen to my people, understand mm -hmm. what they want, understand what the problems are before I do anything. And that's yeah. my priority. My, their problems is my problem. I have to solve them. So my first, very first priority is to listen to my staff and see that they are happy with what they are doing. Because if you, I mean, this work is so sensitive and it's security. So if you had people that's unhappy and people that's not, I mean, they, they, they just not there, they can turn around very quickly. So that's why you will not be able to make everybody happy, but at least if somebody is in a problem or has a problem, even social problems and problems from their homes. I mean, I, I listen and where I can help, I help. And that's why they support me so much. And that's, I'm sure that's, you know, as you said, that's why they support you so much. And that's also why your, your team is so successful, because I know that despite the poaching threats, you still, I think you're zero poaching for over a year now. Am I right? Is yes. that correct? Yes. We, yeah. we, we, we had actually zero poaching since the last poaching was 2017. And then we arrest the guys actually on the spot with, wow. with the help of Save the Rhino Trust, the ministry, and the government, yeah. and the Namibian police. We we work as a group, those three people, I mean, we work in the communities for, we work as a group in, in our region, and, and we speak the same language. So, mm -hmm. um, and that's because we had the success of stopping and controlling poaching in our region. Uh, it was quite for three years, since 2017 August, we had the last poaching, and the only poaching we had was in uh, 2020, and that was actually uh, partly because of the COVID thing and the lockdowns and no tourism and all those kind of things. So it's it's a combination of things that that brought us to that poaching. But even though uh, now we had another year and a half without poaching, it's amazing. 
And on that, on that point, I think I'm going to combine a few people's questions here. So apologies to the people that have been asking, but Nida has asked um, what are the pressing threats for Namibia's black rhinos, but Sue has also asked um, how has the drought in Namibia affected rhinos? And I wonder if, I know there's been a few things, obviously you have poaching risk, yeah. you have impact of COVID, you have environmental changes. What, what would you say is the top pressure at the moment that you're facing or the rhinos that around you are facing? Um, I would say number one is drought mm -hmm. because I can't really control the drought. I can't really do much about the drought. The second one is the poaching, but poaching I can control. I can mm -hmm. still go out and find the poachers and arrest them. And yeah. if my government is so good, they can be punished and given severe uh, punishment and a lot of years and they can spend it again, which will be a deterrent for the other ones that maybe think of one day doing the same thing. But uh, poaching is, can, I, I had it under control, I would say, but drought is my main threat. And uh, climate change is now coming together with the drought and, and it's, it's it's a big threat. Uh, yeah. Although we, we had a bit of rain last year and we had areas where it actually went well and we had a few bones calf, few cows born and, and things like that. And I hope some of them will survive. But um, th the biggest threat is the drought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And as you said, you can't, you can't control it. So it, control it. that's yeah. why it's so difficult because it, it's yeah. unpredictable. <laughs> And um, you know, you do everything you can. With poachers, the way that communities are these days, I mean, we get so many phone calls and they are so good. I mean, if they find someone in their, in their area, which they don't know, he's not from the area, and they don't know me, a strange person, immediately they will call us and say, ah, there is a car with two people in, but we don't know who they are. Please, mm -hmm. can you guys come and have a look? And we will send wow. police officers or whoever out immediately because the police officers are there with us at our um, uh, center in Palabwa, which is the uh, the operation hub. So we've got 40 police officers there that's patrol doing patrolling with us. So immediately we can call and say, hey guys, there is a strange vehicle in this and this area. Can you quickly go and have a look? And they will go and see, I mean, who are you? I mean, they will actually interrogate the guys and ask them and search the vehicle and say, okay, because of security reasons in the region, we are doing this. I think, yeah, as you say, it's testament to the work that you and your team have put in with communities, that you have that relationship and you can talk yeah. so freely yeah. and so quickly to, to, you know, towards a common goal. So, yeah, um, yeah. We're, we're running out of time. So I've got, I've got one more question, which I, okay. I've been so excited to ask you. Um, so I know that you have two children and it's really interesting, I think, for all of us to understand how we can best inspire the next generation. And Alongside that question, so I'm, again, I'm, I'm sort of putting two questions together. So Jane and Anik, I, I hope you don't mind. Um, but do you think there is real hope for the future for rhinos? And, and within that, how do you think we can inspire the future generation to, to continue to do this work in terms of rhino conservation and keep it going? I, I think there is future. That's what I think. But I, I believe um, the younger generation, we um, actually are the people that has to teach them how to go about this. Tell them the challenges we had and tell them the challenges they will face in future. We are mm -hmm. uh, trying to um, uh, protect these rhinos, but also uh, tell them what the good things can be in future for them doing this. I've got my two boys and I've sort of trained them from, I would say from when they were, I mean, when the first one become three years, he was traveling with me all around in the country and then when he went to school the other one was again now three <laughs> years, four years then he was again traveling with me around they could see rhinos elephants elef i mean their minds are already into this although they have got some other things that they want to do um yeah. the one is now a welder um the other one is doing business but still all the time if i say let's go on a trip they will come and they will enjoy the trip and i mean they 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 are already into that that they know that they have to save the rhinos yeah and, um in the program itself in srk we had a, a program we called the pride program which is run uh by one of our officers um and he is only working with uh the school kids and the youth on the street so we we inspire them we actually sometimes bring them together we 
play music like uh, get uh, music players from from the region and they play music for rhinos and i mean uh, and i think there are so many uh, kids youth that are inspired about what we are doing and that things they could i mean they can do the same and i mean me going up and receiving my award now i had so many youngsters that ask me how what can we do to actually get or become like you, you know? Mm -hmm. So the future is there. I think we should, I think it, it's be more Simpson. That's that's what it is. <laughs> we can all be more Simpson. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'm going to leave it there because I'm sure we could talk for hours and I'm sure everyone would carry on watching, but I know that, um, you know, everyone's got dinners to eat or lunches or breakfasts or, or things to do. So um, and we have, we have already overrun a little bit, but thank you so much Simpson for joining us. Um, for all the way from Namibia instead of in the office here. But um, thank you so much. And congratulations again on your award last week. It's been a delight to talk to you. And thank you so much to everyone that's tuned in. So I hope that we can see you all very, very soon. Um, as I said, it is Giving Tuesday. So if you can, we would really appreciate any donations to the appeal to help that Rhino Ranger program expand into Nainai, as Simpson was talking about earlier. And your donation today will be matched, which is absolutely incredible as well. So please do click those links if you're able to. We're going to leave you now, actually, with a short video that Simpson and his team put together in 2020, um, just sharing a bit of the impacts of COVID, actually, and how that's impacted their work. Because as we all know, it's changed everything in everyone's lives. But one thing it didn't stop was conservation happening or the need for rangers to continue to go out and protect rhinos. And that's exactly what Simpson and his team did. So we'll leave you with that. But thank you so much, everybody, for being here with us and hope to see you all very, very soon. I'm Martin Nabasef. I'm Jafet. Uh, my name is Terry. I'm working for Save the Rhino Trust. Save the Rhino Trust work tirelessly to protect the world's last free roaming black rhino. Trackers come from local communities in the area, possessing rich knowledge of the region and its rhinos. In a world now where people are complaining about the lockdown, and as we cannot go for lockdown at home. I'm here out in the bush. We are protecting the rhinos every day during the patrol. Because when we are going home, we, we open the gate and the people will come in and they will push our rhino. Our tourists, they are not coming. And those that are giving donors, they are not coming for us. We are protecting rhinos for the future. I'm still protecting the rhino. I'm here. I'm here in the field for my patrol for every day for my rhino. And I will die for rhino. I'm Samson Urikop. I'm the CEO of Save the Rhino Trust. And believe me, conservation is not on lockdown.